Okay, thank you for joining. Um, my name is Matt. I'm a developer advocate at JetBrains, and with me we've got uh, Rachel. And Rachel, would you like to introduce yourself and let us know what we're going to be talking about today? Sure. Uh, I am Rachel Lapel, also a .NET developer advocate at JetBrains, and today we are talking about IntelliJ's Code With Me and many JetBrains IDEs Code With Me feature. Absolutely. So um, let's dive straight in with uh, a couple of slides to sort of cover some of the uh, some of the details. What what is Code With Me? Really, the the first question. And um, very simply, it's a collaborative development environment, it's a remote collaborative development environment for JetBrains IDEs. Uh, and this is all about working together on a single project, not just um, working on your own separate machines, on separate checkouts of a project, but uh, working together on one instance of a project and one machine. So uh, it's kind of the pair programming uh, tool, really. So it uh, enables pair programming. Um, but remotely on different separate machines and you can all work together on the same code base. And it's not just editing as part of pair programming as well, but it's the full uh, development life cycle. So you can do debugging, testing, uh, and so on. And we've also got integrated video chats and, and things as well. We'll show more of this as we go through. But of course, it's, um, it's all about JetBrains IDEs. And if you're familiar with the JetBrains IDE, one of the things you're going to expect is a lot of the rich IDE functionality. And of course, Code With Me brings all of that into this pair programming kind of space as well. So we've got uh, full, obviously, syntax highlighting projects, um, navigation, code completion. But also, we've got all the inspections and refactorings as well. We brought those through, and you can use those as you are pairing remotely uh, on a different machine. And one of the uh, really interesting things as well is that the guest doesn't require anything. It's really important here that the guest uh, doesn't need to uh, have a version of IntelliJ or, or any of the IntelliJ-based IDEs uh, already installed on their machine. There's no source checkout. You don't have to have the project on your machine at the right branch. You don't have to have the tool chains and dependencies uh, installed or anything built. You can just connect to uh, to the host's machine and, uh, and join in and, and get working. You share a link. You click the link download a quick, uh, thin, lightweight client, uh, and everything else is sort of downloaded uh, as you need it. So what scenarios does it cover then? Uh, we've already mentioned pair programming, and this works with the sort of traditional turn-based pair programming, where you've got two people together, uh, one driving on the keyboard, one sort of sitting there and helping, uh, and then you can swap and the other one takes control. Um, but Code With Me works uh, a little bit more interesting than that. We can do uh, mob or swarm-based programming, so you can get your whole team based in, uh, in there as well. Uh, and technically, you can have up to 100 participants, uh, which is going to be a, a very interesting programming session, I'm sure. Uh, but that also depends on several things, such as licensing and also uh, your network capabilities and the, uh, the, the performance of the host machine. But it's not just about pair programming or, or swarm programming and getting your team inside. Um, there are several other useful ways of using code with me. So uh, mentoring or knowledge sharing is very useful as well. And if this is where you might want to bring in lots of people, is that I can show you a code base and I can take you through a code base uh, and everybody can follow. So I could be the person uh, explaining how something works, teaching something, teaching something new, uh, and I can make sure that everybody who has joined in my session can follow along with me. But I've got the richness of an IDE to work with that, which is a, a big, big benefit. So I can actually make changes, build, change, and, and test, and debug things uh, while I've got all of these people uh, joined in my session and, and carrying on. Uh, and of course, code reviews is, is kind of a part of that as well. Very sort of similar idea. Walk through um, a situation, a scenario, and uh, get some uh, reviews to see how uh, how appropriate the, the solution is and make changes and work with it uh, like that. And of course, um, it's not just pair programming and code reviews. The, um, the pair programming tends to be this sort of turn-based idea where somebody takes the lead and everybody else is uh, sitting back and, and participating, you know, face-to-face -face chatting and, uh, and, and such like this. But we also support simultaneous programming. Uh, and this means basically that everybody can be typing all at the same time. Uh, which is fantastic. So th this is a real benefit over pair programming. So normally if uh, you've got a pair working on something and you've got to the point where somebody just needs to crank out a bunch of bo boring boilerplate code, the other person now doesn't really have much to do. In the Code With Me scenario, when you've got the simultaneous programming, what we can do is have one person go off and do all the boilerplate code, 
But while that's happening, the other person can still be working on the same code base. They could be writing the tests, for example. They could be doing some research for the next problem along the, the line there. So they can still be doing something useful in the same code base uh, while this other, uh, the, the other part of the pair is, is working. Um, which is a very, very um, convenient and um, efficient way of working. So where can we use um, uh, Code With Me there? I've been mentioning IntelliJ. IntelliJ is the platform we use to build a whole bunch of IDEs there. It's IntelliJ IDEA is the, uh, the, the one of the, the main uh, IDEs we've got that uh, works with Java and Kotlin. But basically, um, Code With Me works with or pretty much all of our um, paid IDEs. So we've got AppCode, CLine, GoLand, IntelliJ IDEA, PyCharm, PHPStorm, RubyMine, and WebStorm. And the interesting thing here is that Code With Me works with all of the languages that are available in those products as well. So we're not tied to a specific language here, but all of the features that you can do with Code With Me works across all the different languages. So for example, if you want code completion in Go, um, that's going to work in a Code With Me session as well as on the uh, the host session. The same with uh, web technologies and with C++ and with uh, Ruby and and so on. All the different languages can work nicely with the uh, the different IDEs. Now, we've got a couple of other IDEs which aren't listed on here. Um, for example, we've got IntelliJ Community and PyCharm Community Editions. There is a Community Edition of Code With Me, uh, which works with those products, and we'll cover that a little bit later when we look at some of the licensing. And um, we've also got a couple of products, um, Rider and Android Studio, which Code With Me doesn't work with just yet. We're still integrating uh, Code With Me with Rider, still working on that, uh, and we're hoping to get it all into Android Studio at some point as well. So that's enough uh, chat right now. Let's have a look at it in action. Uh, Rachel, would you like to take us through how you can uh, get started with a session? Sure. So what we'll do first is use the toolbars. And we have a little Code With Me icon. And I'll click the drop down. And I'll go ahead and start off by copying an invitation link. Uh, but as you see, there's some other options here, like security joining or disabling voice calls and turning access off and on and things like that. So I'll click the copy link. Uh, once it's copied, I can then send it off to who I need to. So I'll do that. I'll send it over to Matt secretly. Nobody sees this. <laughs> it's in another window. And in a minute, we should see a little pop up with Matt joining. So right now, I'm just uh, launching the clients in the background here. We'll show this from the other perspective in a sec. But here we are now, and uh, I'm so, ready to connect. OK, now they can see it. Uh, so what it does is it's going to ask Matt wants to join uh, our Minesweeper sample, and it has this security code. And this way, it prevents from man-in-the-middle attacks, because we both have to have that matching code. And I know it's Matt, so I will click Accept. Okay, so once I've done that, it shows a little M for Matt, and I could do a left click to follow him, and that would allow Matt to go around and do things, and I could just kind of sit here and watch. As a matter of fact, you could see him typing now, which is very cool. So I could sit and watch, and if I happen to be in that file, then I'm going to see what he's doing. But I'm not really following yet. So while Matt's typing, I'll do a, a follow here. And you see that little highlight of the editor. Now anywhere that Matt goes, I'm going to kind of follow along and see it. So this is quite nice as he goes through the different windows, the tool windows, as he types or highlights code. Uh, notice all the, you'll see IntelliSense, all of the features that you're used to when you're writing code uh, with IntelliJ, you're going to see here when you're following somebody if they use those features. That's pretty cool. I like this. I just let Matt keep doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to do all the work here. So, um, But one thing we could do is while we're um, working together on something here is we can show uh, a video chat. And so we've, we've got the ability to um, to talk to each other uh, over video chat. 
which is built in. If you can, we're showing your screen right now with a the host there, Rachel, if you want to show the video chat uh, window. Uh, sure. So uh, here I have my option to join the voice call or video. So I'll go ahead and do that. And I should have a window somewhere. Oh, here's the mm -hmm. code. It's down the bottom right there, there the code window. That's it. And we can see now that um, we've got our voice and video chat here. Now, one of the problems is when we're doing an actual recording of a screen, we can't use the cameras to uh, to, to be in the video chat. But we do also have um, – oh, Rachel's got two cameras there. No, <laughs> I nice. have two cameras. <laughs> I, I know I want to wave back, but I'm I'm not in the I'm not in the uh, video chat there. Um, but what we have got as well though is a, a simple text um, a text chat as well, so we can see messages there and we can type messages back and forwards as well. So you don't actually have to leave um, you don't have to leave the environment at all. You don't have to leave the IDE at all in order to be able to uh, uh, to, to have a conversation there. So you don't have to have like a, a separate. Uh, chat app running to be able to talk and discuss what you're doing there. You can do it here. You can still paste um, links or code snippets or whatever you need to do uh, as you're working as well. So it's a, a very convenient way of, of, of working. And of course, then you can always just just hang up. You don't have to have a video chat uh, running at all times. So I could leave that now and um, uh, close down the video chat if we want to. Okay. Okay, should we have a look at that again from the other side? So we have a look at that from uh, the guest now. So we've seen now that there's the host, and as a guest, I, I can join in and I can start typing, and Rachel will see that uh, all being appeared in uh, on the screen. Um, but then the, it's a bit more interesting to see things really, I guess, from the the guest's point of view. Uh, right. And we can see with that there. So if we, if I just close that down, yeah. And if I add my screen back in here, and now and, I can. Uh, You'll notice uh, I was on dark theme and Matt has a light theme. So you were watching my screen and now we're going to see Matt's screen and yeah, that perspective. Uh, absolutely. So, so we want to try and make it clear now that the host is always going to be in the dark theme and the guest now will be in the in the light theme so we know which one is which. Um, I've just clicked the link again there. The session is still is still running. Even though I left the session, um, the, the, the session is still running and I can um, – uh, join again. So I, I've clicked the link which Rachel sent me. I've now got this uh, download and launch button. I don't have to have code with me already installed. I can quickly download the uh, launch, uh, sorry, the, 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 the very thin client, and that will run. And we can see here now again, I get the security uh, dialogue uh, showing up. Rachel will see the same dialogue on her, uh, her end. She would have seen the same numbers as well. We could verify that. Uh, and now uh, we're back in. And you can see very quickly that I'm up and running in what looks like an IntelliJ IDE. And if you're already familiar with uh, IntelliJ, you'll be very familiar with the client because it is basically a, a very thin client of, of IntelliJ. We've got uh, editor windows. We've got the project window on the side here. I can very easily uh, open that and expand all of these things and navigate around. I can uh, get to uh, or <laughs> I can get to the same file that it was already in. And navigate around uh, based purely on that. Um, I've got a terminal window as well. We'll come back to that. Let's hide that one for now. Uh, and we can see we've got a very rich IDE with a whole ton of features uh, already here, just as a very thin client. And it's downloading the information it needs uh, on demand. So I've got all these files listed in the project view here, but they haven't been downloaded to my machine yet. And it's only when I kind of double click, it'll open it there. And we can see we've got uh, full syntax highlighting for uh, JSON files. We've got uh, XML files. We've got Kotlin files here, uh, and uh, I think we've even got some HTML up here somewhere. So we can um, work with a whole lot of different uh, file types with, without any kind of problem here. Now, uh, I am demonstrating this in IntelliJ. I just want to repeat uh, from the slide there that, it, sorry, Intel, IntelliJ IDEA with a, a Kotlin project. Um, we, we work sort of pretty much across the board with the in, uh, IntelliJ based IDEs. So uh, whether it's AppCode or CLine or RubyMine or PyCharm or whatever, uh, it works with those. I'm going to show you um, some stuff in Kotlin and in IntelliJ IDEA today, um, but the same sort of things uh, work there as working all the other IDEs. So we can see we've got the project view, we've got the editor, um, we've also got sort of usual kinds of things we're expecting in, um, in IntelliJ. So the search everywhere, we can just start typing and we will start to see the indexed uh, values appearing there. And so I can navigate to, to field. I can use my usual sort of shortcuts there to navigate to, say, the field test class. 
so yes, yeah, so search everywhere works. If I start typing terminal, I can navigate to the uh, terminal class. I can hit shift to uh, navigate around there. Uh, once I'm in there, I can use the normal sort of keyboard shortcuts to do things like uh, go to file member, and I can just start typing to narrow things down and uh, very quickly navigate around my code. Uh, I could go to, let's have a look, type mines, and it will jump me back to particular um, methods. This is an interface method. It's being shown in the gutter icon there. So of course, we bring all those over from the, the host machine, and I can use that to click and navigate. Once I'm on uh, another method, let's go to display field. I can go to the implementation with the keyboard shortcuts. And that will take me very quickly to the um, to the code itself. So I can do all, all the usual sort of uh, navigation around. I can do control click from user interface there to the actual definition of the interface. Uh, jump back again. And uh, I've got all the usual sort of things we can do. I can do my find usages. There it goes. Uh, and we've got the list of that. Tell you what, let's have, let's have a look at find usages of field because it's a few more things going on there. And we get a full set of find usages. Uh, grouped by um, type of, of how it's being used again, for example. So new instance creation, uh, parameter type, uh, and we can see that it's grouped by file, by um, method, and so on. And we see the line, and we've got um, uh, previews as well. So we very uh, rich sort of normal IDE functionality there. Basically, it's like using IntelliJ IDEA locally, except I don't have any of this code on my machine. All the code is on Rachel's machine and I can uh, work with it there. Uh, and of course, then um, we've got all the usual sort of uh, things for code completion as well. So if we just start typing in some code there, okay, we see some uh, code completion and we can uh, start to work in it and just edit as you would expect to edit. Uh, so we've got all full uh, code completion and all the usual sort of uh, editing features that we'd uh, expect to use there. You can see that uh, we're highlighting um, the, the element under the cursor there just as we move around. And we, that's kind of uh, uh, very nice and sort of showing us where we are and what we're working on. Uh, we can also see we've got the light bulb as well. So we can do Alt-Enter and we can have all of our usual sort of uh, features that are available as we're editing there. So uh, we can... Uh, modify the actual for each there and use a, a, a small refactoring to introduce the, the index into a, a for loop there, which is rather nice. And let's just undo that. We don't need that. Uh, or we could do something interesting like uh, refactorings such as a rename. So instead of calling that a column separator, let's see how about renaming that. There we go. Uh, column separator 22. And you can see now that it's there we go. That, that took a moment. Um, uh, it says uh, column separator 222. It's renamed everything uh, and um, uh, um, run a refactoring for us and renamed it across the whole file. So we see now that there's a, a little bit of latency at times there, but that's because I'm based in the UK and Rachel's in uh, Berlin right now. So this is uh, having to do quite a lot of work across uh, a fair amount of distance. And uh, of course, when you're running this locally on your own network, things will be a, lot, a little faster. And hopefully you won't be recording two or three video streams at the same time. <laughs> okay, so um, next thing to show you then is, um, yep, yeah, so some uh, inspections and things. Let's have a look, let's pop over to some HTML, I think. So we can see now that uh, we've got some highlights going on here. So we've got some uh, uh, source there. So for example, there's no locally stored uh, library for that. JavaScript file, and we've got things like an image tag here, which has got a missing uh, alt attribute. So hopefully we should get, yep, an alt enter to add anything there. So, um, and we can very quickly then uh, edit code and uh, work with it and fix things up. Um, another thing which is useful is we've got uh, integrated with the version control system as well. So we can click on the, uh, the the little icons in the gutter there to show us that there has been some code change. And that will then show us what the value was before. And we can actually uh, roll something back as well. And I think, actually, if we just quickly swap back to the host, uh, if we can show your screen, uh, Rachel, then when you have a look in the commit window on the host, 
and, and to see the, the commit tool window then will show you uh, all the files that have been changed there. And you can see now that we've got two different change lists there. We've got the default change list and a change by Matt change list as well. So the default change list is going to be uh, all the files that Rachel has changed on her machine locally, whereas the, the change by Matt are any changes that I have made, um, they've been automatically put into this change list here. So it's a, it's a great tool for uh, a great way of reviewing the changes that have happened during a session so that you know um, you know, firstly, uh, where the changes come from. So if you don't understand something, it's a case, easy case of saying, you know, asking Matt, you know, what's going on there. Or if there's uh, three or four or five people in the session, you can, it'll be grouped by the appropriate person. You'll be able to ask that person uh, why that change was made. Uh, it also means that I could easily roll back everything that I've made as part of the session, but keep everything that Rachel's kept. Um, and it's a, it's a great way of working with the changes and understanding where the changes have come from. Right, oh, so here we here I see now it's popped up. Uh, I think go. maybe it just took it a minute to refresh. So also, if you click here, it shows changes by Matt. Uh, if I drop down, then I can also see there's the default change list and specifically Matt's changes. So if I take back the the screen there, and we're now again we're looking at the guest. Um, there are um, I guess a, a couple of other things that we could show you here as well. Um, we, we talked a little bit about the, the follow modes as well, which is a, a really useful way of, of working here. So if uh, th this is this is really useful for, um, uh, for for like the pair programming kind of scenarios there, and or the different types of pair programming scenarios, whereby if I am if we're just doing like a traditional uh, pairing scenario there where I'm in the lead for, for a while and then Rachel takes over and, and starts typing. Then it, if you as you're moving around the project, it's very easy to sort of lose where the other person is. So we've got a couple of options here. We've got things like this jump to, which will immediately change the focus of the screen and take me to where Rachel is. You can see now that the, the file changed there and I've got the little R in the uh, tab there to show that Rachel's uh, working here. Uh, or I can also select the uh, follow item there. And now I'm starting to follow Rachel. It says there in the, um, this gives me like a, a green icon, uh, sorry, a, a green border and a, a little note to show that I'm following Rachel there and seeing where she's going. And if Rachel jumps around a bit uh, in the host and navigates to different files and scrolls around there like that, you can see that, you know, I, I'm not touching anything here and the files are scrolling and updating uh, and I get to follow where Rachel is. So if now Rachel's explaining, you know, I want to make this change because of this, that and the other, then it's it's a great way of working as a as a pairing uh, uh, scenario, but equally now I can actually just stop that and it's like oh okay well I actually I need to go and fix something in this interface here and I can I can just easily jump out of the the uh, following session and carry on, but if you're in one of the sort of the mentoring kind of uh, session where somebody needs to uh, explain something and show something then you can also force follow so Rachel could uh, set up force follow on me now. So that uh, without me doing anything, I'm automatically now following Rachel. And where again, wherever Rachel goes, uh, I will follow back and um, and see what's going on there. So again, great for like a, a mentoring session where you need to show people something. It's like you can jump around and people will still see where you are. Um, very good way of working together. Okay, so um, what have we got next then? I think. I think we've got um, we've, we've kind of covered really some of the things with with navigation, with editing, with um, some of the the work around following. Um, we can do a whole lot more with with code with me as well, though. So it's not just about the editing and, and the, the development process itself. It's uh, it's kind of everything as well. So we can do uh, run and debug. So if you can see on uh, the top right here. Uh, I've got my drop down list of run configurations. And again, if you're familiar with IntelliJ, um, these are the configurations you use to be able to run your your, your projects, to, to, to build them, to execute them, to do something. Uh, and I've got the, the drop downs here. And as a guest, I can uh, select these and actually start them there. So if I start running now, um, we can see that this is actually building the, 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 um, the, the project because we've made, been making changes as we've been going. Uh, and now we're ready to uh, to start um, to start typing and um, not start typing. <laughs> I need to start typing here to put in the, the wires. We're ready to start running and executing the the, the program. So if we uh, choose that we've got uh, ten mines here, 
or however many lines we got. And there we go. We see that running. We can actually start uh, running this and building this and, and running through the application uh, and testing it, uh, which is rather cool. And now if we uh, close that down, if we cancel that, uh, so that should finish up on Rachel's machine, I think, in a yep. second. Uh, oh, can I, I want to click the stop there. I don't. I want to stop following Rachel right now. We've got the, the forced there. Uh, what we can also do, if I go to uh, the game window here, again, I'm the guest. Uh, I'm going to start putting a breakpoint in on our main function here. And if I go up to the top right and click the debug button on my run configuration, we're going to start the application again, uh, but this time in debug mode. And I'm the guest, and I'm starting to, to debug this. OK, so uh, we've got our session up and running. And if we type in now the number of mines that we want on the field, let's say 10. Do you want me to type that in? Yes, please. Yes. Um, oh, I see a debugger on my screen. There we go. Yep, absolutely. So we've now hit a break point there, and uh, I'm in the debugging. Uh, so as a guest, I, I've got this, and uh, I can see now we've got the, the terminal uh, class here, which we use to out output things. And we've also got our field, which is uh, going to be the game. We can expand the board, which has got our, our um, array of cells in it. And we can see now all the different cells that's going to be in our little game of Minesweeper that we've got running. And you can see, you know, I, I can just quite happily inspect all of these these values uh, as the guest, which is good. Uh, and if we just uh, swap over to Rachel's machine, uh, we should be able to see that Rachel's going to be seeing exactly the same thing. So what what's happening now is that we've we've uh, we've we've run the application on Rachel's machine. We've now also started debugging the uh, application on Rachel's machine. But as the guest, I can still see everything that's going on there. And we you can see that we've got basically the same view of, of what's happening. We're at the same breakpoints, uh, and we're at the same uh, point in the code, uh, but we can both have a look at the sort of in inspecting the values independently and um, changing the call stack and, and, and so on. So if I just grab the screen back, uh, we've got all the usual sort of things that you can do with a, a debugger there as well. Oops. And if I sort of hover over the field uh, value there, we've got the hover tool tips which we can then expand and again we can have a look at the the values within the board uh, and i can step in as well and so i can keep going and if i step over that that means i need to read a turn so uh rachel if you want to type in the next turn oh let's see uh maybe. Okay, it didn't. Oh, is it two four free or free two? It's two four free. <laughs> I did it backwards. <laughs> ah, there we go. We're, yes, so there there we are now. So we've, we've got the values. We can see that x and y are the values you've typed in. Um, uh, let's hide that for a sec, and uh, I can just can carry on sort of uh, stepping over, and I can step in. Um, yep. So we can step in. Uh, and uh, navigate around, and we can debug uh, just as as normal. So yeah, so uh, full um, full fidelity debugging uh, while you're a guest, while you're a host, uh, you can sort of uh, share, and you can kind of do pair. <laughs> it's the equivalent of pair programming, pair debugging. It's um, it's a a, a a great way of uh, of working with your stuff. Um, it is the though, sorry, Rachel. Oh, I was going to say it is though. Like, how many times have you had to? Call somebody over. Hey, look at look at this. Take a look at this debugging session. Why can't I find what's happening here? Oh, now yeah, they absolutely. don't even have to leave their chair. So. Yes, yes. And you know, of course, if you're not even in the same office these days, then exactly. uh, we can uh, work with this. Um, the, the the next thing to show then is uh, it's not just about debugging and running the the applications. So we can run, we can edit, we can run, we can debug, we can also test. So if I jump over to this uh, field test class, uh, oops, let's close that down here. We can see we've got just a, a simple uh, class here, which is a, a test case. We've got the gutter icons here showing us that we found uh, we found a bunch of tests. Uh, and again, we can just click these 
and we can either run or debug the test. And we can uh, very quickly run these. Uh, and again, hopefully it does this without building. There we go. And we've, we've got the tests run uh, and I can use those. I can double click. Uh, again, we've, we've got um, a very useful sort of way of working with that uh, to make sure that everything's okay. And let's introduce uh, a bug here, I think. So if I change uh, this value to be um, unmarked, this test should fail. So let's, if we, oops, if we run this, Uh, that'll quickly compile the code, it'll run it again, and we get to see now that there's going to be uh, a failing test. And again, uh, as the guest rather than as the host, um, I'm going to be able to sort of click around the the, the results there and um, navigate to the to the to the error and fix it. There we go. I can uh, I've got my call stack, my massive uh, Java-based call stack. <laughs> and uh, I got the link there as well, so I can see the difference between the the, the values, uh, and I can uh, of course then uh, go off and fix it. I can double click on that to take me to the code uh, and and fix that. Um, the last thing I think I want to show you as part of the, the guest there is um, a very interesting uh, value uh, item here. Is we can use a remote terminal, uh, and so this is something which we need to be a little bit, bit careful of. But um, I've now actually got a terminal uh, window onto Rachel's machine there. So I'm sitting there in the uh, current directory and I can uh, run commands there and I can uh, have a look at what's going on and um, use terminal commands. So obviously there are gonna be sort of some concerns around this. You need to be, uh, to, to trust your, um, the, your, the people who you're pairing, your participants to be able to do this. Um, but it's basically, it's a, a very useful way of being able to um, work together on uh, extra code there and working with the, with the remote terminal. Um, and that, of course, then is a, a nice segue, I guess, into uh, into security and permissions. Rachel, do you want to show us some? Uh, well, in fact, actually, if we look at your screen, um, it, yeah. it, I think the key thing with the terminal to point out is that you get to see everything that's going on and everything that I'm doing. So if I launch another um, uh, directory listing, I get there, and if I do uh, a little echo command there, it'll work there. So although I am running commands on Rachel's machine, I'm not doing anything that Rachel can't see. So even if uh, Rachel tries to hide the window now, and if I start typing again, the window would pop up and we would uh, see what was going on. Right. Meanwhile, you can see that I have a super secret file here that I have not locked you out of yet because I gave you full permission to do all this. Yeah, yeah. so we've got... Um, a ton of uh, permissions which we can set for uh, a code with me session, uh, and uh, by default everything is locked down uh, and read only. But we then uh, also have the option of changing these permissions. You can change them at the start of a call. You can change them during a call, uh, and there's a, a whole bunch of things you can do there. So um, we can have read only files, um, or, or you can have the ability to edit any files there. Uh, and you've also got this idea of having hidden files as well. So we can have this super secret file. If you've got, if you've got passwords or something in a file that you don't want to share, you can uh, add this into this hidden files there. And this does not get shared with any of your participants. Okay, so I just uh, hid that super secret file. So you should not be able to see that now. Uh, yeah, if I, or in fact, let me, let me put the screen back on. Uh, yes, we've got. I've got the uh, file down here in the uh, project view. But if I if I double click on that or try and open that, it just doesn't open. So I can open any of these other uh, files. But uh, if I try and open super secret file, it doesn't let me. So that's that's really useful. Uh, other other permissions that we've got in there as well is that we can disable the access to the terminal. Obviously, and, and by default that is off. Uh, you have to explicitly add that yourself. Uh, and we've also got permissions of whether you can run and debug as well. So you, you only get these kinds of permissions by being granted them, um, which is useful. Okay. Um, so I think actually, let me see. We've got uh, some slides now about some security. Oh, no, I want to add that. That's what I want to do. So um, a couple more things really to, to say about security. Um, so we've got a whole load of, as I say, permissions which we can change. Um, you know, 
uh, the ability to, to have read-only or editable files, hidden files, whether you can debug or um, run uh, any run configurations, whether you've got access to other um, tool windows, such as the Gradle tool window we, we had available there if you're using a Java application, uh, and also the terminal window. While you're in a session, all of the traffic is encrypted. So everything is end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, nobody can listen in on the uh, the conversation that's going on, the, the, the video calls or the actual um, traffic, such as your files going being, being sent from machine to machine. Um, the end-to-end -end encryption there is verified with this access code that you have at the start of the uh, the application there. We, we didn't go into too much detail about that, but you see this application code. Uh, it's a four-digit four pin, and basically you just need to make sure that that number is the same at both ends, that Rachel's number is the same as my number, uh, and as long as they're the same, then we know cryptographically that there has not been a, a man-in-the-middle attack, which is uh, which is good to know. The values are different. There's, then there's some, something wrong with your... Uh, with your session. Um, traffic itself, we have a lobby server which we use in order to start the session. Uh, so when you first create uh, a link and to generate the link and so on, there is a lobby server which JetBrains maintains and runs. And um, when you then connect, uh, sorry, so there's nothing uh, more than sort of um, machine names being sent across there in order to set up and, and start the, the server name, uh, sorry, to start the session. Uh, and then once the session has been uh, is happening, then whenever possible, we will try and do peer-to-peer -peer or direct uh, communications between the participants there. If that's not possible, e.g. for some things like um, network tra traversal and for proxies and so on, then we can uh, send the data through the lobby server, but all of that data is encrypted. Again, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. We don't see it. So it goes through the JetBrains lobby server, uh, but we don't get to see it. Uh, and finally, we have the options then as well. If you would prefer not to use the JetBrains lobby server at all, you can then host a lobby server internally as well. So that means you can keep all of the traffic from um, from Code with Me internal to your own network. So uh, that would be the, the the setting up the initial session, then the um, peer to peer communications uh, for the actual session itself. And if you still need to have any kind of NAT traversal traversal uh, internally, then that can happen purely on your own servers. Okay, so um, so that's it really. That's a, a bit of an overview of uh, Code With Me. Uh, just to round up, just to to um, to, to re uh, recap, uh, it is a remote collaborative development uh, tool and environment, um, not just for pair programming, but for uh, uh, you know editing, code completion, inspections, refactorings, debugging, testing, uh, and so on. It, it gives you a, a very rich set of ID functionality there. We've got integrated video chat, so you don't have to start up an, another chat session um, in order to be able to, to discuss what it is that you're working on or to, to copy and paste code snippets or links. Um, there's nothing needed on the client computer at all. It's just a lightweight on-demand client, which is uh, installed as you need it. Um, as I say, yes, rich IDE functionality. Uh, so all of the, the nice features that you are used to from um, from, from the IntelliJ-based IDE, so the refactorings, the, the renames, the uh, navigation and the inspections and so on, they're all there ready for you. Uh, and it is bundled with most of our JetBrains IDEs, as, we, as we've seen there. Um, as I say, the only ones which are, are missing so far are Rider and Android Studio, and we're working on that. Uh, and obviously, we've got a, a, a big focus on uh, security. Um, so that brings me to, to licensing. We do have a community version of this, so it's a, a free version. And this is included in IntelliJ IDEA community and PyCharm community. This allows you to have up to three guests uh, and a session of 30 minutes. Um, but if you have a paid version of the IDEs, so if you're using the All Products Pack, for example, or if you have an active subscription for any of your um, uh, and any of the, the actual uh, IDEs itself, then you get uh, Code With Me bundled with that, is a part of that, and uh, you just click the link in the toolbar button and get going. You can host up to 50 guests there. So again, great for your mentoring sessions, everything from pair programming up to, to full mentoring uh, and unlimited session length there as well. So it's not going to, to finish after 30 minutes. Uh, and then at the, the top tier, then we've also got an enterprise version as well where you can host up to 100 guests in a single session. Uh, again, unlimited session length. Uh, and here now you've got the ability to have an on-premises server um, so that you can have uh, the traffic and keep all the traffic uh, within your code. Um, uh, uh, within your own network. 
So uh, Code With Me is bundled with uh, the, the 2021.1 20, uh, releases of the IntelliJ tools. Uh, the, it's already there. You can click the button in the toolbar itself to get going, start a session, send somebody a link, let them join, and give it a go and see how you get on with that. Uh, which then leaves me just to say, um, if you want more information, you can go to our uh, short link there, jb.gg slash cwm for Code With Me. Uh, and then uh, thank you for watching.